Uh, Joe is concerned about inconsistency, which is certainly the black eye of wind power. Agreed? All right. Uh, a lot of us wind professionals, we don't want to talk about that because, it, you know, it's certainly a concern. There have also been technologies brought out recently about storing the power with water. We'll just go ahead and pump that water uphill while the wind's blowing. When it's not blowing, then we go ahead and it comes down and creates hydroelectricity. Uh, so that's certainly a viable option. But with the smart grid, uh, it kind of tweaks it just a little bit. Um, we're talking about, let's say we've got a 10 mile per hour wind and we have a 19 mile per hour wind. And obviously we've got averages in there somewhere. But how on earth does the hot water heater that we were talking about earlier, how does it know to kick on? It doesn't. But there are certain technologies in place that would tell this hot water heater over here through communication, comes up here, communicates to that hot water heater, hey, it's time to kick on, there's power, it's cheap, let's go ahead and get this going, and this hot water heater kicks on. Okay? All right, next question. All right, yes, yes. Uh, he, he just asked, are, the, are peak hours Do they cost the same? Okay, this, no, they don't cost the same. And peak hour electricity is considerably more, considerably more expensive. And when all things considered, you've got here in North Texas, let's go ahead and talk about North Texas. Here in North Texas, the hot water heater is not our big thing. In summertime, we're talking about the air conditioner. And this little air conditioner runs and it runs and it runs and it runs and it runs it seems like doesn't it our power bills get more and more and we're looking at other things that we can do to insulate to work around this air conditioner and how do, how do we make it work a couple months out of the year it just absolutely kills you getting your bill so uh, how do we do it well if we go back to this how could we apply that we've got 10 mile an hour wind 19 mile an hour wind Okay, this thing kicks on. Dad's gone to work, mom's gone, all the kids are gone, the home is just sitting with nobody in it, and this AC, does it really matter when it kicks on to keep that temperature the way it is? No, absolutely not. So instead of the thermostat ruling when the air conditioner comes on, this rules when the, when the thermostat kicks on and when that air conditioner kicks on. So, boom, we have a big wind, this thing's turning, it then communicates to the air conditioner, go ahead and kick on and use the energy that I'm creating, and the house gets cooled, and everybody's happy because we have supply, we have demand at the same time. Uh, the question is, is smart grid new? Uh, no, it's not really new technology uh, per se. In 2003, Austin had actually re started replacing a lot of their meters. Right now they have probably a third of them replaced. About a half million customers have gone to the smart grid. Uh, so as far as new goes, even right here in Texas, we have stuff going. Next. Question is uh, the end user, the homeowner, the commercial business owner, if they have a photovoltaic roof system, um, then they're pumping power back into the grid. Uh, our, our power grid really hasn't changed over the past 120 years, so to speak. Uh, with the smart grid, it, it does change that considerably because it's got to coordinate the power that's coming back off that roof or back off those panels or back out of your wind turbines and it has to coordinate all that coming back into the system because right now it's a one-way street and it has safety issues tied to it. Uh, we have a lot of technology issues as far as our standard grid goes as far as feeding power back into it. So if, if we really do look at that on a, on a scale here, our end user has a little wind turbine, let's say, We'll give him a great little wind turbine. And 
his wind turbine is kicking on and it's, let's stick with noon, and it's kicking on and it's kicking power back here. And the grid says, I don't need this power right now. That's exactly how it, how it would be right now. And so how do we maximize that? How do we work with that? That's what smart grid's all about, is coordinating where this power goes, how it can be used. And without that coordination, uh, it's just simply feeding back into the system and it's being relatively unutilized. Next. So with that, let's go ahead and talk about the one that raised so many eyebrows, resist attack. I guess all of you guys are wondering what resist attack means, except for Charles especially. <laughs> yeah, there you go, there you go. All right, we have power lines. Okay, storm comes along, knocks power lines down. Now we have this mess, right? Okay, now, let's say that happens on 2nd Street. All right? Now, the department wanted this power outage on 2nd Street to contain itself so that we still have power on Walnut and we have power over here and power over here and just this dies. Okay, this is an absolute dream according to our current state if you'll totally agree with me. Let's have it isolate the incidents and so and we have, if we have a hurricane, we have power outage down, instead of having two million people out of power, we'll have about 2,000 people out of power after like a Hurricane Ike like I just went and helped clean up with. This would have been something that the Houston area would have absolutely loved. And so the Department of Energy is looking for some improvements with resisting attack. Does that make sense now? Okay, very good. Okay, the question is how do the consumers save money from this smart grid? And how do we get a return on investment, is that correct? Okay, yes. Um, all good numbers, where do they come from? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> all, right, all right, very, very good. This one, you, we understand, correct? Okay, CO2 emissions, pretty easy. Okay, fossil fuels, all that kind of fun stuff, CO2 emissions. Yeah, okay. All right, as far as these dollar amounts go, okay, we're going to go ahead and, and grab where those came from. Uh, you remember our scenario about the water heater. Okay, so if you've got a water heater, it could be a dishwasher, it could be an air conditioner. Uh, if you go down the list and think about all the appliances that run in your home, it could be a clothes washer, or the one that really kicks you is the dryer out of the pair. If these things are, are set to turn on when we have a surplus of power coming through the grid, then that's going to save you significant money. Because the power company will be able to, when this is in place, be able to offer you discounted power on off-peak hours and actually uh, work with you on the pricing as far as if they know that this wind power is going to be used when it comes in, guess what? We're going to see more wind farms because the inconsistency isn't as big a deal anymore because inconsistency is then compensated for. And these rates will drop because we're not burning up the fossil fuels that we were without this guy or without the PV, the photovoltaic. So you can see where it starts saving the consumer a lot of money because then the consumer can do what? That's right. He can create as much power as he wants and even feed it back into the system and it can be compensated for because of the upgrades that have been done with the smart grid. Alright, any more questions?